Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Secret Sonics. This is episode 84 with Matt Boudreau. Um, this was a real privilege for me to get to chat with Matt. Matt is the host of the Working Class Audio podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts in general, let alone audio. Um, and he's such a sweet guy, and I'm just honored that he was able to take the time to to chat with me. And we got to talk about his podcast, but we also got to talk about a lot of other stuff, how he niched into mixing, um, how he's introduced mastering into his repertoire, how he's prepping to mix, you know, out of the studio and on the road in the future when I guess COVID is over and he, you know, his wife retires. We talked about coffee. We talked about mixing a rock band from his hometown that was like a passion project. And we got into that in the sauce segment. So I think you're really going to love this episode. We get into so many things and um, Matt is just a hell of a guy. So without further ado, let's jump into it. This is episode 84 with Matt Boudreau. You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. And welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Matt Boudreau. Matt is a mixing and mastering engineer, as well as the host of the Working Class Audio podcast. Matt started out his career in San Francisco as a drummer in the late 80s and early 90s, playing in bands like The Sexants uh, and Seven Day Diary, and working in the studio with producers and engineers like Larry Hirsch, Joe Ciccarelli, and Gil Norton, who Matt learned the process of record making from. In 1994, he traded his drumsticks for faders and never looked back. After numerous studio ventures and years of freelancing in the Bay Area, Matt now works from his home in Lafayette, California, mixing and mastering and hosting the Working Class Audio podcast. I found Matt's podcast, Working Class Audio, years ago and have been an avid listener, so I was quite thrilled when he graciously agreed to join me on the show. So with all that to say, welcome to Secret Sonics, Matt. Oh, thank you, Ben. Great to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So yeah, I feel like having listened to your podcast, I really feel like I know you, which is like the beautiful thing about podcasts. Um, and I know you've told your story on several other podcasts, but you know, just for my listeners, could you give like a brief uh, story about your journey, how you got into music, how that led into music production? Sure. I grew up in southern New Mexico in a small town called Las Cruces. And I, after high school, moved with the band that I was in at the time, the Sextants, which was a, <clears throat> a excuse me, a three-piece band. We moved to San Francisco to be rock stars. That's, I'm using air quotes, audience. And um, a lot of our friends and peers were like, they loved us, but they said, oh, man, that's a one in a million chance. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Some people tried to talk me out of it. And when I got there, we got established. And within three years, we had a record deal with a, with a, a label in New York. That started us on the journey uh, that started me on the journey of, you know, wanting to be a rock star, but also getting exposed to record making in the days of um, when we had tape. There was no Internet, no cell phones, no, no Pro Tools. It was all, you know, as you've read in the past, it was all, you know, two inch, 24 track tape. And I did that for uh, a few years. We eventually got dropped uh, from the record label, the label went under, and then I joined another band called Seven Day Diary that eventually would be on the Warner Brothers record label. Kind of a similar thing, you know, in the process of the record making. The Sextants made their record at Ocean Way in Los Angeles, while Seven Day Diary, we made our record at uh, Britannia Row, which was owned by Nick Mason, drummer of Pink Floyd. We made that in London. And Oh, wow. You know, very similar processes in making the record, but just the difference, you know, being in Los Angeles versus London, very different. And eventually that band got dropped too. And I worked a series of uh, jobs at pro audio shops, working in warehouses, doing sales, doing uh, some support, some technical support for people. And eventually found my way into a small studio and began the journey of recording and kind of stopped putting drumming as, you know, that being my primary instrument, stopped putting drumming as the thing that drove me and recording became the thing that drove me. Uh, in 1994, a band asked me to produce a record. I did it, and that just lit my mind on fire. I was, I was hooked after doing that. I thought, forget this drumming thing. That's, this, that's a drag. <laughs> I'm going to do this <laughs> recording thing. That's more up my alley. And since then, I've just, you know, I've, I've had a couple studios and one in particular, uh, was a Bill Putnam room in San Francisco. And it was, it, when I got into it, it was an opportunity to grow. Unfortunately, I got into it at uh, the time when the economic crisis 
in around 2007 was just really taking a foothold and business was not good. Yeah. I had to take everything that came in and wasn't paying the bills at home, barely paying the bills at the studio and really causing a lot of tension in the family. And by 2012, I had to get out. And that experience really rattled me in a big way. And it caused me to want to ask my peers and, and my friends questions about how they survive as audio professionals. So I started the Working Class Audio Podcast as the vehicle to do that. And yeah. since then, I've kind of retooled and reconfigured my life um, with everything. And so I'm in a much better place and definitely have learned a few lessons along the way. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, Working Class Audio is one of the biggest podcasts in the industry. What about it do you think uh, really struck a core with listeners? I think the thing that really got people interested is the fact that it wasn't another show talking about gear. You know, I, I don't have anything against that. I love gear just as much as the next, you know, audio professional. But to have another show entirely dedicated to, you know, what's the best kick drum mic in every situation? And, you know, what snare drum mic do you use on Tuesdays and Fridays, but not on Sundays? You know, those kind of like really yeah. like, I'm exaggerating, but those are kind of off the wall questions I've heard asked of people uh, or, you know, variations on that. And I thought, I'm not interested in that. I don't care. I want to ask people about them, their their mindset, their decision making process, the things that I want to learn for myself, the things that I want to grab for ideas to apply to my life. And that includes asking, you know, some questions that some people will find boring business questions, money questions, family, you know, work-life balance questions. So I think that that approach to the show brought people in. And it's kind of like a blend between uh, probably um, Terry Gross on NPR in the States and um, and tape op. You know, it's like you blend that, those two together and you have a great combination that appeals to a lot of people. Yeah, I love it. That's what I loved about the show also, is that it wasn't just all gear talk. It wasn't like getting too nerdy about that stuff. It was just really hearing people's stories. And, and you know, it's clear to me that you follow your curiosity, which is something that I've also learned, you know, maybe from your podcast and some other podcasts is just, you know, whatever's interesting to you is definitely going to be interesting to other people because, you know, we're all humans and we all share certain interests, you know? Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I was watching this morning, uh, they were talking about the death of Larry King. Mm. And they were they were interviewing him about you know why he does what he does and he just said I'm just a naturally curious person I, I just I want to ask people questions that I'm curious to know myself and it I I never realized it before but how much I I actually had in common with his curiosity that that curiosity is something we we both shared yeah I think the best podcasters and the best interviewers just have a curiosity and because yeah like I said before just you know. If you're curious about it, other people are too. So you got to follow that, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm sure you've learned so many lessons from, you know, hosting the podcast as I have also. <laughs> um, clearly, you've been down this road a lot longer than I have. Uh, what uh, What would you say is one lesson that you think you've been able to most incorporate into your own life as an audio engineer? Whew, boy, there's been a lot. You could list multiple if you, if you wish. Yeah. You know? I mean, I could just rattle off a series of things. I mean, patience, word of mouth, how to treat people diversification. You know, I'm not the only one that has, you know, thought of diversifying their, their income streams, but just hearing what others, other people are doing and, uh, persistence, really persistence. You know, a lot of my guests in their start and I'm, you know, I've been at this for a while, but still the message I think is, is relevant is don't, don't take no for an answer in, in all situations, you know, or if somebody says, come back next week, Mark it on your calendar and come back next week and follow mm -hmm. up and, and do that. So, you know, a lot of the people that I've interviewed, like Chad Blake, you know, they have a, a certain level of persistence about them in, in pursuing their, their dream. Yeah, I love that. And that's something that I've also found interviewing other people is, is that people that just keep doing it, they end up winning, you know. And uh, like I, I had a plumber come over to fix uh, our hot water urn. Uh, for the shower. And he said, oh, my son's in interested in, you know, audio and production. Uh, and he was like, "Like, whoa, this is a studio in your house. This is crazy. And I was like, yeah, like, listen, the only reason I'm still doing it is because I'm still doing it. So if, you know, if your son's interested, he's got to just keep doing it. That's the only thing 
that's the only reason we're still at this, you know? Yeah. It's going to, you know, as you know, it's going to become uncomfortable and difficult at times, but you know, what isn't uncomfortable and difficult? Yeah. So if, if it means a lot to you, I always just say, uh, don't stop, keep showing up, keep, keep persisting. Yeah. So I, I know that these days you're mostly mixing and mastering. How would you say that, you know, how did that transition go for you? And how did you build up a, you know, a clientele of, uh, of mixing and mastering work? In the beginning, or in the early days of, of when I was working, and I had studios, obviously, you would be the place where people would go to record. You'd end up doing all the overdubs. You'd most likely do the mix as well, which is great because it's it gives you the opportunity to be involved in all those parts of, of the record making process. It gives you an opportunity to make some money at each part of those processes. But, you know, when you don't have a studio, like I'm in the position of now, I don't have, you know, a, you know, a studio per se. I've got a room that's a mixing and mastering room. And, you know, might be good for the occasional vocal overdub, maybe. <laughs> so when I gave up my last studio and came home to work, I realized that, you know, if I'm going to if I'm going to track anybody, I'm going to have to go out to other studios and that's OK. But over time, I just I, I really kind of started to adopt the idea of just like getting rid of things, just, you know, like process of elimination of, in your life. And a lot of that, and I'm I'm gonna potentially go down a rabbit hole here, and I'll try to avoid it. But I was go for I it. was really turned on by these uh, these people uh, that these two guys that run this show called The Minimalists, and they have a podcast. They have a couple things on Netflix. Oh yeah, I've seen the Netflix one. Yeah, those guys really influenced me. So I started to think, okay, well, you can eliminate the physical goods in your life and really kind of pare down, which I, is I'm constantly trying to do that. But you can also do it in your life in other ways. And I started to think, you know, maybe I should just put my my focus on mixing and mastering as far as, you know, the, my, my recording practice. And by doing that, I'll eliminate the need to constantly buy microphones and too much gear, which <laughs> I'm still working on that. But yeah. <laughs> it, also, it also just hones you into those those two parts of the process. So, you know, I started to just reach out to people and say, hey, you know, I know, you know, I gave up my studio, but I'm working from home now. I got this great setup. Things are translating. Um, it, you know, if you are considering, you know, putting a new record out, let me just put my name in the hat for mixing or, or for mastering. Uh, the mixing thing really kind of stayed steady. Uh, it, 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 it really worked itself out. And I, and I have, you know, it's not like a constant flow of clients, but especially during COVID, but I definitely have oh some boy. people that, that come to me for that particular thing. The mastering thing I got into probably shortly after my interview with a, an engineer in New York, Robert L. Smith. And Robert was an engineer who was doing mastering. And I had come from a, a mindset because of the people I spent my time with uh, who were dedicated mastering engineers um, in the Bay Area, it would be like, you know, Michael Romanowski and Paul Stubblebine and John Green. And John, of course, went on to work with uh, Billie Eilish. Oh, wow. And so I was always of that mindset that, oh, you know, if you're going to do mastering, that's all you're going to do. But then mm -hmm. more, the more I talked to my guests, I realized, you know what? I know what goes into mastering. So... I don't consider it the same black art. It's just a different mindset, a different perspective when you're listening to music. And I thought, why on earth shouldn't I do that? And I was a little hesitant to do that. I had a little imposter syndrome going into it. But then I talked to Robert, Robert Smith about it. And then I talked to John Cunaberti about it. And I don't know if you know who John is. John's worked with uh, Joe Satriani and some other, uh, some other folks. And uh, Yeah, I've heard his name before. Yeah. Perhaps on your show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And John's a John's a, a local guy here, and uh, has done some great records. And he was doing it, and I just said, you know what, you need to get over it. And then the 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 nail in the coffin for it. I guess that's not a really good phrase to use for this, but the the thing that kind of uh, pushed me over the edge. I was talking mm. to a producer friend of mine, Michael James, uh, who'd worked with like the New Radicals and 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 Hole and stuff, and 
we were at a we were at a party for a, a pro audio company, and I told them about. 